Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's a common factoid that's shared around by luminaries such as the Guinness Book of Records that the first email sent from space was sent from the space shuttle Atlantis on August 9th, 1991 by Shannon Lucid and James Adamson. The mail went, Hello Earth, greetings from the STS-43 crew. This is the first Apple link from space. Having a great time, wish you were here. Send Cryo and RCS. Hasta la vista, baby. We'll be back. And, you know, those of you out there with a keen understanding of cultural references can guess that this historic event happened while the biggest movie in the world was Terminator 2. And usually, that's where the story stops, right? All those other people, they just talk about this. But I'm a computer nerd, and I really needed to know more than just that. So, we know that the computer on Atlantis they used for this was a Macintosh portable. And while Apple may be all about mobile devices today, the Mac portable was the first portable Apple computer. And there's a reason why I put quotes around that, because draggable is more apt as a descriptor. It masked about 7.5 kilograms, 15 pounds. Do not imagine that this was a laptop. If you put it on your lap, you would probably risk serious injury and your ability to become a future parent. The Mac had previously flown in space on STS-41. It was being used in a series of experiments to understand user interfaces in zero gravity. It turns out that using a mouse in zero gravity is not ideal. So they were trying other kinds of input devices. And also, the Mac wasn't the first computer that was flown on the shuttle. Since very early on in the shuttle's career, the crew had been flying with a computer known as the Grid Compass. It was their payload general support computer. It was a tough computer ideal for space flight. It used a solid state storage system that employed bubble memory rather than those fragile spinning disks. And it had a wonderful bright high contrast orange screen. And if you've seen the extended version of the movie Aliens, then these are the same computers that they use to control the sentry guns. But the Compass really wasn't built around a graphical user interface, and the space station that NASA was designing was going to be the most high-tech thing ever created by humanity, and there was no way they were going to let it use some ancient, you know, aging, cryptic command line interface when there were user-friendly windows, icons, mice, and pointers turning heads and wowing the crowd. So the Mac was flown because it was built with pointers from day one, and it supported a bunch of cool and interesting hardware for controlling those. It let scientists really explore the possibilities of human-computer interaction. So it had already flown on STS-41, but STS-43 was going to be the one where they actually tried to network a computer in space with systems on the ground and send electronic mail, or email as all the cool and trendy people call it these days. But to be clear, this was not like modern email that's delivered over the internet using IP addresses and TCP and stuff. While the internet did exist at this time, the messages were confined to the Apple Link service. So Apple Link was an online service the users could connect to with a modem. It offered bulletin boards, file transfer, and the ability to send memos to other users. And the memos were functionally identical to what we would call email. Everything would be within the Apple Link service, though. No external connections to the internet existed at this time. And Apple Link wasn't just for Macs, by the way, it also supported the Apple IIGS. So Apple Link actually ran on uh, General Electric Information Services mainframe computers. GEIS offered businesses shared access to mainframe computers so they could run all their business operations and stuff without having to set up their own data centers. And Apple Link first launched in 1985 as a system that used this to communicate between uh, Apple's network of dealers around the country. Eventually, access was expanded first to universities, and then if you had the money, you could get Apple you know, online for about $15 per hour, right? Now, just on the side, by the way, Apple Link wasn't the only service running on GE's back end. Uh, Bill Loudon realized that at night, most of these big servers were more or less sitting around idle because, of course, you know, businesses happen during the day. So General Electric Network Internet Exchange, or Genie, 
was launched, priced at $6 per hour at night and $36 per hour during the day, Genie had all the best online games at the time and lots of sci-fi writers ended up using the service including J. Michael Straczynski who announced some TV show called Babylon 5 on there and Babylon 5, one of my favourite TV shows, just celebrated its 30th anniversary of the series debuting. Anyway, back to Apple Link and the shuttle email. On STS-43, the communications experiment was designated DTO-799, PGSD slash PADM air ground communications demonstration. So PGSC is the payload general support computer, the aforementioned grid compass, and PADM was the portable audio data modem. And the modem was of course key in communication back then, right? This would be talking back to Earth. The space shuttle already had amazing communications capabilities compared to all previous space programs. It had been launching the Tracking Data and Relay Satellites, or TDRS. In fact, the primary payload on STS-43 was TDRS-5. These satellites sat out in geostationary orbit and they enabled communications with the shuttle when the shuttle didn't have a line of sight to the ground stations. The shuttle actually supported digital communications pro uh, protocols at bit rates that absolutely eclipsed the lowly dial-up connections that us earthbound plebs generally had to deal with. Right, like the telemetry and the voice communication, all that stuff would take up about 216 kilobits per second. But the shuttle could also send data like a real-time video as as much as as a 50 megabits per second. So it was able to scream out data. So yeah, there wasn't also an existing teletype communication system on board. So that from the shuttle, they could send up uh, like text to the teleprinter to provide written instructions and messages to the astronauts on their trip. And sometimes these printouts could be huge. They would spill out of the printer in zero G, making for some comical sights as astronauts tried to make sense of the massive instructions flowing out of this device. So a big part of the air to ground communications experiment was to provide a two way equivalent of this and maybe one day eliminate the paper copy if it wasn't needed. So now the question is, how do you connect a Mac to this space age digital communication system so it can take advantage of all that bandwidth. Well, it turns out that modifying the digital communication system to support a data link to a device on the flight deck was not possible with resources they had on hand, right? So they just hooked up an old school modem, the portable audio data modem, to an audio channel. Uh, and let's be clear, the space shuttle communications were all digital, including the analog audio, which was converted to a digital format for transmission and then decoded and converted back to audio. So the modem on the flight deck, it would convert the digital data on the computer to analog audio and vice versa. So the binary data on the computer was converted to an analog audio signal by the modem, fed into the shuttle's audio processor, which could convert it to a digital signal, and then beam that to the TDRS satellites, which would then send it back to the Earth at White Sands, and then that would be sent across the country on data links to the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And there, the data would be decoded, including the shuttle audio. And some lucky person at JSC could have picked up the wrong phone and, you know, sure, no doubt have listened into the modems screeching at them, right? But anyway, according to the documents that I've found, the protocol they used was a V7, a V27TER, half duplex. That's a fax protocol that uses 1200 symbols per second at two bits per symbol making a total data rate of 2400 bits per second. And the half duplex part is significant. It means that this is a one directional transmission. And when a pair of modems share the line, only one can be transmitting while the other is receiving. And I think this may be down to the fact that shuttle audio were, was like a push to talk system where you would push, talk, and then you would release and you would listen. And so running a modem over this had to run with the same constraints. So I know you might think the obvious next step is just to plug that audio from the shuttle into a phone line and point it at the Apple Link phone number. Well, it turns out that wouldn't work because the servers running Apple Link's modems required full duplex two-way communications. So instead, they connected that audio out 
to a gateway Macintosh that was set up in JSC. On one side, it had a modem that was connected to the regular Apple Link services through the you know, regular phone line. And on the other side, which actually had to be connected to the printer port because you know, normally the modem takes the modem port, um, it would talk to the uh, shuttle communications. And there was a special piece of software in there that would understand half duplex signals, you know, tweak them around, repackage them, and on the other side, it would talk to the Apple Link services and make this whole thing possible. So that's how it was supposed to work, but they did have a number of technical problems. The first time they tried to do this, uh, there was some data switching system on the ground that was asleep. So they had to like power cycle their system and the, uh, decoding on the ground. This next time they tried, it failed because that hardware was still sort of in the process of waking up. Finally, the third time they hit send, it sent and it worked and history was made. Now, an interesting side of this on, on this was that they used the standard Apple Link memo service, which was you know, basically email, but the email addresses weren't protected in any way. So it was they had to keep the shuttle email address secret. In fact, they registered STS43 at Apple Link as an address so that curious people would be sending to that address rather than the actual shuttle address. So anyway, after this flight, the Mac did fly again, but NASA elected to move the communication systems over to their tried and tested grid compass laptops. And I don't have any information on exactly how this operated beyond knowing that it used the same kind of modem. There might have been the same Mac at JSC for all I know, or they might have run their own bulletin board at NASA, right? NASA BBS. There's very little information on this. There's a few references to the modem still being used and there's some photos of crew using it on later missions. But I do know that by 1998, the email system was able to receive messages from the general internet because Bill Clinton sent an email to the crew of STS-95, which included Senator John Glenn. And he used a laptop that belonged to somebody that was in the right place at the right time. It wasn't a government laptop. It was like some doctor who was there and they used his AOL account to send a message to the space shuttle. And this is the first time, by the way, a sitting US president has sent an email. And Bill was also the only president to attend a shuttle launch. Like Obama was actually supposed to see uh, STS-134, which would include Mark Kelly, who of course is now a senator. But that launch was scrubbed and uh, Obama wasn't there when they retried again. Incidentally, by the way, AOL also has its roots back in Apple Link because when Apple wanted to find an alternative to paying GE for their very expensive services, they approached Quantum Computer Services, which had built a very similar online system for Commodore 64 users. And from this, they produced Apple Link Personal Edition. It was launched in 1988. But because it wasn't using the GE backend, there was no way for the regular Apple Link you know, users to interact with the Apple Link personal users. And the service didn't really go for long. The partnership was dissolved in 1989 and uh, the service was rebranded, relaunched as America Online. So anyway, yeah, in 1998, I do know that the sh on the shuttle, the computer that they were using now at that time to read the mail was an IBM ThinkPad running PC-DOS. And I'm not sure when they transitioned from the grid compass to the PCs, but I do know that at that point they were still using a 2400 baud modem connection because there's a document from 1999 where NASA is looking for a replacement modem and this is part of the specification. Of course, these days, the space station has amazing communication capabilities and like the space station has Wi-Fi. Not only does it have Wi-Fi, it has Wi-Fi antennas on the outside so they can talk to spacesuits. And last year, there was actually a demonstration of a video link from an approaching cargo spacecraft from 600 meters away, more than half a kilometer away, they were able to get a Wi-Fi signal. And that's the kind of thing you can do when you don't have tons of other people with Wi-Fi networks clogging the airwaves. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.